How's it going, runners of the wild? Thanks for sticking with me through these videos on the hips. But as you can tell, it is all in the hips. So we've covered a lot of stuff. We covered hip flexion last video. We covered internal rotation on the video before that. We covered a lot of different injuries. Today, we're going to be looking at my backside. And while you're looking at my backside, hopefully you guys have seen this sweet hat. So really liking this guy. It's just in my, my birthday run. I know that's not me running my birthday suit. I'd probably get into trouble out here. I just went for a little run on my birthday. And yes, I'm getting old. So when we're talking about hip extension, we're talking about the leg going back. And we're also going to talk about injuries on the back side of the leg. I've kind of had to generalize things to cover a lot of ground here. So first of all, when we're talking about hip extension, why is it so important? Let me go ahead and shut this off so it's making weird noises at me. Well, it's very important because that's A, how we move ourselves forward. B, if we lack hip extension, we're not going to be able to wind up the tissues on the front part of our upper leg to create kind of an elastic recoil or like a rubber band effect that shoot us back into hip flexion. So the more elastic recoil we can use, think if you wound your muscles, tendons, and ligaments up and let them go like a bow and arrow, the less work we have to do. And in the running world, we say that breaking is less costly than propulsion. So what's that mean? It's easier to slow down my leg from an elastic recoil than it is to push my leg and pull it forward. So I want to wind up tissue. So believe it or not, we sometimes talk about this Goldilocks zone where we're not trying to get extremely mobile and we're not trying to get super tight. We want to be in that in-between ground so we can use what we've got to its full capacity, which is called efficiency as a runner, especially an ultra runner. That's what we're trying to max out is running efficiency. So what do we need in terms of hip extension? The textbook would be 10 degrees of hip hyperextension. It's called hyperextension because if we're moving from neutral, which would be if I'm laying on a table, you just turn me into a, a dead guy, I'm a cadaver, hyperextension would be beyond the anatomical plane, right? Through the coronal plane here. So hip extension actually is coming back down to neutral and then 10 degrees would be me towing off to run forward. You see obviously a lot more hip extension the faster you're going, the slower you go, we tend to lose some of that. Now, let's talk about one of the biggest myths or misconceptions as far as it correlates to hip extension. A lot of talk in the physical therapy, rehab, performance world is on glute inhibition. If we actually look at the research and not just look at it, read it and interpret it, we actually see that there's far more hamstring inhibition secondary to like a hamstring tear of that like grade two, grade three strain, than there is with all of the, what we think is correlative glute inhibition with like ankle sprains or low back injury. Now we do see timing differences in the glute, but your glute's still working, right? So what we're gonna focus on is how do we actually get hip extension first? How do we maybe help any hamstring injury since that's our big player and a lot of runners to get that high hamstring pain, which we may see is kind of the intersection of glute and hamstring. And then also, what are some things that we can do to start training in our running hip extension? Because if I had to say, if I had to pick something out, especially on distance runners that they don't tend to get in their gait, is hip extension. So we see very short strides in our ultra runners, especially the older we get, lack of hip extension. And then what starts to happen is our, uh, our old buddy, Billy the ultra runner that, you know, maybe he's just cruising along at 10 minute pace per mile comes and he says, my low back kills me when I run. Well, we try to take Billy's hip into extension and what happens, his hip doesn't move and his back does. So that would be the biggest compensation that we see for lack of hip extension, like truly being tight through your quad and hip flexors is you have to trade hip extension for low back and all of a sudden my main mover for forward propulsion becomes a lot of this. And we don't want a lot of that unless it's birthday night, right? And it ain't birthday night yet, so we're trying to run. So, talk about what we need, talk about why it's important, talk about a common fault, which tends to be lumbar extension versus hip extension, hamstring inhibition, right? The hamstring, in particular, your semi-membranosis, big old guy on the inside here, does three times more work in hip extension than our glute. The glute gets all the attention because they look good when I'm doing my Instagram posts. Right? So just keep that in mind when you're cross training in particular. So how do we rehab injuries around the hamstring? 
and some injuries around the hamstring. Hamstring strains, right? Uh, you've probably heard ischial tuberosity bursitis. Uh, let's even throw trochanteric bursitis. We, there's something called ischial femoral impingement, where you get the little muscles over here, kind of tension between the lesser trochanter and your uh, ischial tuberosity. Uh, anything, sciatic pain. Sometimes we, we tend to think that it's lumbar radiculopathy and it's just an old hamstring injury, or latent sciatica. It has no lumbar component to it anymore. It's just an inflamed sciatic nerve itself, or the dreaded piriformis syndrome. Yeah, I said it. Yeah. Believe it or not, it really doesn't exist a whole lot. You truly have to have an anatomical variant to get piriformis syndrome, and only about 28% of people walking around have that variant. Can you get tight there and it can cause some issues? Yeah, but to have piriformis syndrome, which I guarantee you somebody watching this and then diagnosed with that, I highly doubt you have that variant. We never know until we look at it on imaging. But, so how do we load a hamstring without hurting it when we're rehabbing it? Well, I talked a little bit last video about tendonitis, tendinopathy, and how compression of a bone against a muscle or a tendon causes a big component of that tendinopathy. So if I'm gonna load my hamstring, a lot of ways we would think about loading your hamstring is say like a deadlift, right? What's happening? My big old sit bone is pushing on my hamstring here. What's another really common thing that we see happen when we get tendonitis, a hamstring strain, is we wanna stretch it. Right, we put our leg up on something. Well, what's happening? Again, compression. So we gotta rethink what we're doing here. And if we can load a muscle and go through those phases that I talked about last time, where we're going isometric, eccentric, ballistic. Again, you got questions on these big science terms. I know it's crazy. If you got any questions, guys, just hit me up. I don't wanna talk over your heads, but I wanna throw this stuff out to you because I'm probably talking to some very educated learners out there as well. So if we're going through that loading phase, I just want to give you some maybe hints on ways to load it without compressing it. So talking about glutes and hamstrings and some misconceptions, I guarantee you everybody out there that's ever had an issue at some point on the backside of the body has been prescribed or read in runner's world about doing a glute bridge. If we look at the research on the glute bridge, it's far better for your hamstrings than your glutes. So let's do that glute bridge, but for the hamstrings, okay? So I do a couple different things here. I've got these slide plates that you can buy at furniture sliders at Home Depot. I like to come up into a glute bridge with my heels on this guy, come up to neutral, so now you can see no compression on the hamstring, right? I'm basically in that same anatomical plane that we were talking about earlier. And now if I try to keep my hips locked into neutral here, I'm just gonna control, this would be an eccentric load, right? How can I make it less taxing? Hold, now it's isometric, right? What am I feeling? Big old hamstring, some of you might cramp doing this. I can try to control it all the way down. If you're a rock star, you lock your hips into place, squeeze your non-inhibited glutes, and you raise right back up. That's tough, you wanna make it really hard to kick one out. Control it all the way down. I'm not even gonna to attempt to come back up because I'm probably gonna cramp and roll around like an idiot, okay? So that's really high level. What would be really easy is if we don't have the slide plates, our typical glute bridge looks like that. Well, let's walk those heels out, come up. Now you're in a hamstring bridge, and we can hold. We can come up and down. Now we're getting back to birthday night, right? Okay, how do you make it really hard? You can come up on your elbows, come up onto those heels, and now you can seesaw or rock. And now it's an isometric load on your hamstrings but you're also using different parts of the hamstring at different times to eccentrically and concentrically load. So that's a really kind of high level drill, okay? So we've got hamstring slides, we've got hamstring bridges. Now, let's say we're out of the, kind of out of the danger zone. Any Top Gun fans out there? Hope so. We're out of the danger zone. Tom Cruise has come over to my house to train and be like, what are we gonna do now that I'm in pain in my hamstring? And I say, you know what? I think we're gonna do deadlifts. Because now if I have no pain on compression, I can go through a toe touch, I'm like, ooh, this feels pretty good. Now I want to load it, right? So what's a safe way to start doing a deadlift without compromising any of the, maybe where the hamstring is really torn? Go halfway down into a deadlift and hold. Work on our breathing, which we're gonna go into next. So the next two videos will probably be on breathing, guys. So we just hold 30 seconds, and we're trying to send those hips back, like if somebody grabbed me by the shorts, by the belt loop here, and pulled me up on a 45, it's gonna build a lot of tension. 
Now, if I'm feeling really robust, I just go through the whole deadlift, sending those hips back, right? So all the things that you guys have probably seen, and there's literally an endless amount of exercises because you could vary the position, the, the terrain, you could put me on a, you know, an air X pad with this and, you know, single leg deadlifts, all sorts of crazy stuff. You don't have to get really fancy to do really good rehab, okay? So talked a little bit about how to load your hamstring. Now, let's say I don't have very good hip extension. Maybe that led to this hamstring strain, right? I'm really having to dig with that hamstring to bust through my tight hips. Super easy drill. And we could do things like foam roll through the hip flexor of the quad. We could have somebody like myself or my wife behind the camera do some manual therapy, massage therapy, whatever it is, right? If we have truly tight muscles, and muscles can be tight for two different reasons, and I'm making a big generalization, neurologic tightness. The muscle's tight all the time. Not when I go to load it. If I'm at rest and I can feel that muscle being tight, that's neurologic or trigger point. Now, if it gets tight as I go to the load, that could be true fibrosis, right? One portion of the muscle could have been scarred or torn like that hamstring, and now when I go to the load it, it's like whoop, and yanks. That's where we may need some manual therapy or some other intervention. But I have a video on our YouTube site called a triplanar hip mobilization. That's what I'm gonna show you guys. I think it's an awesome little drill to just start feeding hip extension versus lumbar extension. So I want you guys to be able to squeeze your glute here. And all we do is we think that we're gonna push our hips under our torso so far, but I'm not gonna let that low back go anymore, okay? So we do 10 pulses, okay? 10 pulses forward. Once I've hit 10 forward, I'd lock those hips forward. Whatever hip I'm working on, that arm goes up. I go over to the side 10 times. The hip stays forward. What we see a lot of people wanna do with really tight hips, I get them up here, they start going forward, and then you see this. And now my hip's not loaded anymore. Last move for the triplanar, arms parallel to the ground, lock that hip forward, glute squeeze, rotate away from that hip. So you can see the three planes of motion, right? Sagittal, coronal, transverse. Super sciencey words. Wikipedia, write me a report, put it in the comments. I love it, I'll read it. Okay, a couple more things here. So now, We've talked about how to load stuff up to get it better after an injury, how to improve a little bit of mechanics. And I know this seems so simple, but if you don't have very good hip extension, just doing something like this is where you gotta start. If you start doing these big stretches, like a big couch stretch up against the wall, A, you're gonna stay there for about three seconds and then wanna throw up and go out of the stretch. B, it's probably not realistic. You gotta start somewhere. You wouldn't go run 20 miles on the first day you start running, you're gonna run two or three. Same thing when you're working on mobility and rehab, okay? So now, let's throw a couple drills at you to where we can feed good hip extension into running. One really simple one. A lot of runners tend to do lunges. It's like a cross-training drill, right? It just seems to be a single leg movement that gets programmed a lot. So if I'm doing a lunge, it tends to go forward. Well, I'm gonna challenge you to get those slide plates out. You can use towels on hardwood. You can use paper plates on carpet. So now what I wanna think is, I'm gonna go ahead and squeeze that glute. I'm gonna push down into my slide plate. I'm gonna get my arms going just like I'm sprinting. And I'm gonna drive my leg back into hip extension, down into the ground, and I'm gonna sit this puppy down. And now what am I in? I'm back in my triplanar hip mobile position. And then I'm gonna come back up. Now, how can I make this harder? I can put a band around my foot and push back as far as I can and shoot back up. Really easy. Now, a little more running specific. I'm gonna have Sloan follow me over here with the camera. So these are called hip snaps. I didn't make this drill up. This is actually a pretty old school running drill. A hip snap is just trying to get you to realize when I hit the ground with my foot that my hip should be snapping back into hip extension. Okay, so how do we do that? You have one foot up on the wall. Start at neutral, you go back until you barely tap the wall with your glutes or your back end. As soon as you do, boom. Squeezing that glute, pushing through your heel, right? So we're just training hip extension here. You don't have to snap your fingers, you don't have a rhythm, just you do it without the snap, okay? So a hip snap, really, really easy drill. And the biggest, 
not the biggest, probably the most commonly prescribed drill for myself to a runner is something I call a leg cycle. I have a full video that goes over this. If you guys want to dig through my YouTube channel, you can find it. I'm going to do it over here on the rack. If anybody's ever rode any, uh, read any of Niccolo, was it Nicholas Romanoff? I'm probably killing that. The pose running guy. If you've read any of his stuff, he talks about the leg cycle and how to basically go through the hole to create a short lever, right? I want my leg to be short so it moves fast versus this long lever, which is slow and harder to control. So a good drill for that is just starting slow, tracing your foot up your knee, all right? Every time I hit the ground, I'm tracing that thing up my knee. And as I get going, I go faster. Now, if anybody's looked at any CrossFit endurance stuff, Brian McKenzie does a lot of this pose method stuff. And there's all sorts of drills, right? So now we'll come out of weight and we'll start going through basically little skips with this. And we can take this off and run it, right? And this is where some of the things like an A skip, a B skip come through. But we're trying to ingrain in your head is you're using that hamstring to draw your leg up into our drive angle, create a short lever, then use the hamstring to pull that short lever back and then unload it. So what do we see most ultra runners or most, most long distance runners do? Really short stride, keep the leg long, draw it back. Now it's a lot of work to pick this big old log up and swing it back around. It's a lot easier to use your hamstring, use your biomechanics and put that thing back up. All right, so that's a leg cycle. You can see why it looks like I'm riding a bike. Again, I have a whole video on that. It goes way more into detail. It does it a lot more justice than that short little 30 seconds. So we're done with the hit. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I'm game for any questions on anything really, injury related, more knowledge as it pertains to the hit. We're diving into breathing, which will also parlay into a little bit of like core control, core stability stuff, but big time in the breathing, which I'll share an article that I wrote for Trail Runner Magazine with you guys, and be looking for that video next time. I'm gonna go enjoy my birthday. See you guys.